Uh, I'm noticing in my monitor here, my shirt with the stripes is causing some wiggly lines to appear. So I hope that doesn't affect the video. Unless it looks looks cool, then then I hope it does. You know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I did notice this in today's school paper, um, as I picked up. Students teach faculty a lesson in the annual softball game, 26 to 4. All I can say is you can tell I wasn't there. Because if I was there, it would have been something like 32 to 1 or something. I would have probably damaged the faculty's cause by, by being there. All right. Today we're going to do a couple things, a couple things on the agenda. One is we are going to take a look at the database we did last time, except this time we're going to use surrogate keys. That is, we're going to use auto number keys. If you remember last time, we didn't do that. We, we um, used um, um, what are called sometimes natural keys. Um, we're going to look at why you cannot create foreign keys. What problems might occur that would prevent you from creating foreign keys is probably a better way to put it. So we'll look at that. And then finally we'll start looking more at different sorts of relationships. All right. The database we had last time looks like this. Can I go a whole class with having the right thing on the screen at the right time? We'll see. It's two minutes after and I haven't made a mistake yet. So. We're on a roll. Last time we had, actually, did we use surrogate keys last time in this? Actually, we did. All right, so I guess we already did that. Uh, by surrogate keys, I mean auto number keys. What uh, the, the meaning of surrogate key is, is it doesn't really mean anything outside the database. It's just there to guarantee that it's unique. A as we said last time, you're not going to run out of numbers. Each one's going to get its own number. And the nice thing is, is the database generates it for you. So if I go in and put in a next faculty person, I don't even have to keep track of what the next faculty ID is. It will automatically assign them their right value. All right, assign Doug a, a value of four. So that's what I mean by a surrogate key. For the most part, you could do this, or you could use another thing as a key. Um, what we said, though, what was nice about these surrogate keys, these auto number keys, is they're numeric. It's easier to store numeric data than alphanumeric data. All right. Um, they're not going to change often. As a general rule, you don't want your keys to change very often. All right? And you know that they're going to be unique. And you can make sure that every row has one. So they're sort of the perfect candidate for keys. So in a lot of the tables I, I create, I use auto number keys. All right? And it seems like a good idea to me. All right. So, boy, that was easy. I, I, I forgot that we covered this last time. I, I thought that was something that was still, still left outstanding. All right, we have built a relationship in this table between faculty and the clubs via the faculty ID. And again, this is a one-to-many relationship, which is one of the main kinds of relationships that we're going to encounter in a database. You have to read it both directions. That is, one faculty person can be the advisor for many clubs, each club only has one faculty advisor. And we created the foreign key. I'll delete it temporarily. Simply by dragging faculty ID to faculty ID. And then by checking enforced referential integrity. We'll not worry about these right now, but we will worry about the enforced referential integrity because that's what really makes it a foreign key. That's what makes sure that we can't put something in the club table that doesn't match up with something in the faculty table. So you need to do that to really have the advantages of a foreign key. All right. If you do it correctly, you'll notice the one to many. It, it looks just like the ERD. If you don't do it correctly and you don't enforce referential integrity, it'll just be a solid line. So if you see a solid line, on your uh, uh, relationship diagram, you know that, that something went wrong. All right. Now, what would keep you from creating a foreign key? And I'm going to delete to start out. 
with it so that I can recreate it. First thing that would keep you from creating the foreign key is if you had the table open. So if I was editing the design of the faculty table and I tried to create a foreign key, I'm going to get an error saying the database engine could not lock the table faculty because it's already in use by another person or process. That makes sense. If someone is into that table and someone's doing something to the structure of that table, you don't want to allow someone to, to create a foreign key because they could be in the middle of making a change to that table that would mess up the foreign key. So therefore, if someone's in the table, it's off limits as far as the foreign key is concerned. So that's one reason that you might not be able to create a foreign key. All right. So if you try to create a foreign key and you get an error, if it says something like this, it's because you have it open on another screen. All right. That's the first potential problem that you could run into. Second potential problem would be something like this. To design a, or, or to implement a foreign key, the type of data has to match between the two fields. So if you notice what I did there real quick is I changed the faculty ID in the uh, club table to be text instead of a number. All right, I went in in design view and I changed the faculty ID to be text. I can't create a foreign key between fields of different types. So in the faculty table, it's an auto number. All right. In the club table, it's not going to be an auto number, but it should be numeric. It can't be text. So if I try to create a foreign key here, it will tell me the relationship must be on the same number of fields with the same data types. So uh, you can actually have multiple part foreign keys. You could have two things pointing to two things in the other table. All right. Uh, but even if there's just one thing, it has to be the same type. I can't have a text field point to a number. All right. A third reason why I might not be able to create a foreign key is if there's already bad data in the table. What do I mean by bad data? You know, bad data, bad data. No. What do I mean by bad data? I mean data that already violates the constraint, the foreign key constraint. So I got rid of the foreign key, so there is no foreign key constraint now, which means I can put anything I want to into the club table. So I can put into the web development club a faculty ID of 888, all right, and it doesn't blink at me. Why? Because I haven't set up the foreign key yet. Now, if I go in and now and try to set up the foreign key, it'll give me an error message saying you can't do that because there's already data in the table that violates the foreign key. So you have to start with a clean slate. You have to make sure that if you're creating a foreign key that there isn't anything that's bogus initially when you create it, that everything in the one table matches up with something in the other table. So those are the three things, three reasons that in Access, anyhow, you won't be able to create a foreign key. If you have the table open in another screen, you won't be able to create the foreign key. If you have different types of data, you won't be able to create the foreign key. And lastly, if there's already bogus data, that is data that doesn't match up, you can't create the foreign key. In this case, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go in and You know, set this to a legitimate value and then go in and create the foreign key. So let me ask you a question. What would it be better to do? Create the tables, create the foreign keys, and then enter the data? Or create the tables, enter the data, and then create the foreign keys? Which would be better to do? The first option, which was create the tables, create the foreign keys, and then enter the data. The reason for that, again, what, what is the reason for that? 
Pa pardon me? You'd have an audit of the record. Yeah, you'd have an audit. In other words, uh, maybe to use the terminology that, that's used more often, that constraint would already be in place. You would be restricted as soon as you started entering data to make sure that everything in the one table matched up with something in another table. If you do it the other way around, you don't know that. You could put in some data that doesn't match up and then you'll get an error trying to create the foreign key. All right. These foreign keys are, are critical to proper database design. Remember, going back to the first lecture or two, that really the advantage of relational databases, one of the big advantages is that it provides more accurate data. All right? It provides better data. One of the ways it provides better data is by having these relationships stored and these foreign key constraints so that you can't put something in that doesn't match up with something in another table if it's supposed to match up with the other table. All right. Um, any questions on this? All right. So the first relationship that we looked at, the first kind of relationship we looked at, was a one-to-many relationship. And in this case, the relationship is between faculty and club. The nice thing is, is once that we look at these, foreign, these, these relationships, every time we run into a one-to-many relationship, it will work about the same. All right? There's a couple very common patterns that we're going to find. And once you're able to identify the pattern, you know how to create it in the database. All right, so that's sort of the good news of this. Some of this might be very confusing at first, you know, all this talk about relationships and keys and all that. But the good news is, is that once that you get a grasp on it, all right, any one-to-many relationship you implement the same way. All right, and how do you implement it? Well, whatever's on the many side should point, should have an attribute that points to the primary key on the one side. So I'll use, in a lot of these, I'll use one star equals primary key, two stars equals foreign key. So if I have faculty ID and faculty name and so on, and I have a club ID, which is the primary key in this table, and club name, etc. Because this is a one-to-many relationship, the faculty ID in this table points to the faculty ID in that table. All right? Because we're using the primary key of this table, we know that this faculty ID can only point to one faculty person. Right? Because whatever value of that primary key is, there's only one faculty person that has it. Right? So if I have 1, 2, 3, 4 stored as a faculty advisor for the chess club, I'm not pointing to two faculty members because faculty ID is the primary key of the faculty table which means that there's only one faculty person with a faculty ID of 1, 2, 3, 4. All right? And the very fact that I've defined it as a foreign key means that I can't put in, as a faculty advisor in the club table, a faculty ID that doesn't exist in the faculty table. <laughs> Keep in mind as we're doing this and as we're entering this in Access, we're entering it in simply through this data sheet view. All right, so right now we have to remember those faculty IDs. Later on, we'll use forms to enter the data in here. I wouldn't expect someone to remember, you know, there's a few hundred uh, uh, faculty members here at LC. I wouldn't expect someone entering the data into this database to know all the faculty IDs of the few hundred faculty members here. All right, so just to get some data in here, we're doing it this way if we were going to go and make this a real application that would give to someone else to use, would develop some nice little forms that would assist the user in putting that information in. Questions about what we've covered so far with this? One to many relationship. You know? I joke that it doesn't matter what these tables are. You don't even have to know the language they're in. It could be in Klingon. All right? If we had a database design that Worf did, all right, and this was that table, and this was that table, 
And if we know that there's a one-to-many relationship, we know how to implement it, right? This is going to be the primary key of that table. This is going to be the primary key to that table. And this table, the table on the many side, is going to have that is a foreign key. All right. The reason I say this is a couple reasons. First of all, I notice that now Star Trek is available on Netflix streaming, and that's a good thing. All right. That's the first reason I use this example. The second reason I use this example is it's important to recognize once you have the patterns down, you know how to do it. So if someone tells you there's a one-to-many relationship, let's say, between, to give a more, more real example, if someone were to say there's a one-to-many relationship between department and faculty, which there is, a department can have many faculty, a given faculty person belongs to one department, I know how to implement that in the database. I'll have a department key, a faculty key, and the department ID will be an attribute in the faculty table, and it will be a foreign key to the department key in the department table. All right. Once you recognize that pattern, that's how you do it. All right. And that's why it is so important to be able to recognize the patterns, because when you recognize the patterns and you recognize whether relationships are one to one, one to many, many to many, you then know pretty much how to implement it and how to create the tables for it. In fact, there are some tools even that if you draw the relationships graphically, press a button, it creates the database for you, right? Because the rules are that mechanical for doing that. All right, it's very straightforward once you've identified the patterns and the design, what the tables are going to look like. All right, so that's the one-to-many relationship. We talked last time that there are three relationships, and we said that two of them we're going to look at now, one of them we're going to defer until later on. And the one-to-many was the first one, and it's a pretty common one. The other relationship is a many-to-many, -many, and then finally there's a one-to-one. -one. This one we're going to do later. That one we've already did. We're now going to do the many-to-many -many relationship. So, let's put back up the diagram, or let's redraw the diagram. We have faculty member, club. We've identified that there's a one-to-many relationship between faculty and club. That is, one faculty person can be the advisor for many clubs. A given club has one faculty advisor. Important to note that to, to really check the cardinality of this, you have to look going in both directions. One of these can have how many of these? one of these can have how many of these. And that will tell you, in this case, one faculty person could have many clubs that they advise, but one club only has one faculty advisor. All right. Let's get some students into the mix here. All right. So let's add a student table here. Now, what is the relationship between students and clubs? Well, one student can be in how many clubs? Uh, probably many. A given club has how many students? Also has many. So this would be an example of a many-to-many -many relationship. All right? One mistake that students often make is they'll go only in one direction. And will say, okay, a student can be in many clubs, therefore it's a one-to-many. No, you've got to go... One student can be in many clubs, but one club can have many students in it. You have to go looking both ways. So there's a many-to-many -many relationship between student and club. We mentioned last time, I think, or one time before, that really 
you could say there's a relationship between faculty and student, but really that relationship is derived through the club. In other words, how does a student have a relationship with a faculty person in this little database? Well, if they belong to a club that that person advises. So there's no direct relationship between faculty and student in this model. That relationship is derived through the club. All right. Uh, in other words, you know what? You know if if we if we think about classes and teachers and students, what students do I have relationships with? I have relationships with the students that are in the classes. If you drop from my class, then I was no longer to be said that I have a relationship with you. So really, the relationship in that example is between faculty and class and student in class, and there's no direct relationship between faculty and student. Just like in here, the relationship is between faculty and club, student and club. There's no direct relationship between faculty and student. Now, many-to-many -many relationships cannot directly be implemented in a relational database. And we can do one of two things. In fact, you know, I'll suggest one of two things. I'll, I'll try to explain why that's the case. All right? I'll try to explain why that's the case. And maybe you'll, you know, maybe, it'll, maybe you'll be able to understand my explanation. If I don't, then just remember that you can't put in, you know, forget why for now, maybe later it will come, but just know that you can implement a many-to-many -many relationship directly in a relational database. All right. Why do I say that I can't implement a many-to-many -many relationship? is like this. Let's just look at the relationship between student and club. Oops. So let's say the primary key of the student is the student table, uh, student ID. The primary key to the club is the club ID. If I put a club ID in this table, what would that mean? Certainly one club could have many students, right? Because there could be a bunch of students that have club number 100, all right? However, there'd only be one place for a club ID. That means that this would not be a many-to-many -many relationship, that this student could only belong to one club, and that's not correct, all right? So if I put a club ID as a foreign key in the student table, that would limit a student to being only in one club. So that's wrong. That would not be a many-to-many -many relationship. If I flip this around and put a student ID in the club table, you have the same problem going in reverse. All right? I could only put in one student ID in the club, and that means that each club could only have one student, and that's not correct either. So I can't put a club ID in the student table because that would limit each student to one club. I can't put a student ID in the club table because that would limit each club to one student. So I can't do similar to what I did with the one-to-many relationship. Now, you might ask yourself, couldn't I do something like put three spots in the student table for clubs? You know, club one, club two, and club three. Not a bad thought, but it's not a good idea. All right. The reason is, is what if there's a student that was in four clubs? You know, what's the most number of clubs a student could be in? I don't know. All right. Who knows? I could go over and and and, and sit in the cafeteria and survey people as they were going by. Hey, how many clubs do you belong to? And take the highest number. But you know what? Maybe five minutes after I left, <laughs> person's walking by that was in one more club than that. You don't want to build that sort of restriction in your database that you're limited to four clubs or you're limited to five clubs or whatever. Because as soon as you make that assumption, something's going to happen and there's going to be someone that does more than that. Just like if I was doing a library database, right? How many authors can a book have? Well, most books only have one author, right? But some books have two authors. Some books might even have three authors. So remember, in database terms, it's either one or many. 
We're not interested in two or three or four or whatever. So we don't want to build the constraints and have, say, 10 slots in the club table for students because then they have to turn away the 11th person that tried to join the club, which wouldn't be a good idea. All right, so we can't do the many-to-many -many the same way that we do a one-to-many, all right? So what do we do instead? We actually break down a many-to-many -many into two one-to-manys. So, in other words, this diagram gets translated into this diagram. And let's, let's talk about this a minute, and then we'll actually see it in action. What this is saying is this. The student table has a list of all the students in it. The club table has a list of all the clubs in it. The student club table matches up what students are in which clubs. So let's take a student, student one. All right. If student one is in club 10, 11, and 12, then there'll be three rows in this table. One with a student ID of one and a club ID of 10. One with one and 11. One with one and 12. So that table matches up what students are in what clubs. All right? What do you suppose the primary key of this table is? The student club table. Could it be the student ID? No, because we've already seen the fact that this student ID is duplicated a couple times. So you can't have duplicates for a primary key. Could it be the club ID? No. Maybe not, maybe what I have here it looks like it could be, but there could be another student in club 12 and another student, all right? So the student ID by itself can't be the, the primary key. The club ID by itself can't be the primary key. So the combination of the two becomes the primary key. The combination is unique, right? No one's in the ski club twice. All right, so you don't need to put that I'm in the ski club and, oh, yes, by the way, I'm also in the ski club. All right, you only need to put that in there once. So the combination of the two of the are unique. Now, to be sure, I can be in many clubs and the ski club can have many members, but the combination that says I am in the ski club, there only needs to be one row in that in the database. So the primary key in this case would be a combination of the student ID and the club ID. Those would also be foreign keys to their respective tables. In other words, the student would point to the student ID in the student table, as would the club ID. Let's see this in action. Let's go and put this into access. So, here we are, create table, go into design view, and I'll create the student table. I'll put in student ID, and I'll make it an auto number. I'll put in student first name, make it text, student last name. make it text. And I would put a list of all the attributes that I want to keep track for student. Um, in these examples I go over in class, especially the first few examples, the focus is on the, on the entities and the relationships between the entities. So I'm not necessarily going to put a lot of attributes in here just on the interest of time. But we could put in anything that you'd want to store about a student. You know, their birth date, their uh, city, state, and zip, their address, their email address, their phone number, 
their major, any sort of other information that we would want to capture about a student. For now, we're just going to settle for a first name and last name. All right. So, I have my student table. And again, for the reasoning that I gave before, I can't directly put a relationship between the student and club. I have to build that sometimes called an intersecting entity or an intermediary entity because it goes between the student and the club and it allows us to achieve that many-to-many -many relationship. So I'll go in, whoops, not quite yet, and I'll create another table and I'll call it the student club table. Usually what I do is if I'm making a many-to-many -many relationship between two tables, that intersecting table simply give the name of both of the other tables. So, in this case, between the student and the club table is the student club table. That's the table that matches up what students are in what clubs. So, student club table. I'll make a primary key the student ID. It's not going to be an auto number because in this table I don't want it to automatically generate the student number. I want to be able to assign this student belongs to this club. And likewise, club ID will be a number. And I will make both of them the primary key by simply highlighting the two parts of the key and clicking the little key up here. And that defines that as a primary key. Now I can go in and I can put in the relationship. So I've created the intersecting table. I now can create a relationship, or actually two relationships, um, one between the club and the student club, one between the student and the student club. So let's go in here. I can right mouse and say show tables, and I can add the student and student club to my drawing. I can arrange these whatever makes sense for me. But then I can go in and link the club to the club in the club table and enforce referential integrity. Likewise, I can link the student to the student ID here. So in this case, part of the primary key of one table is also a foreign key to the other table. And that's legit. And that's typical when you have a many-to-many -many relationship. It is rare for an entire primary key to, to be a foreign key to another complete primary key. But part of a key to a, a primary key is, is legit. All right? Remember, something's always going to point to someone's primary key. right? Because the whole notion of this is we want to point to the one that that row belongs to. All right. So we then have a student club table that is sort of the intersecting table between student and club. All right. So let's go in and enter some data in here. I'll save that. Let's go into student and we'll enter John Doe, Mar Army, Mary Jones. It's late, so my names are not going to be very imaginative. Jim Davis, Sue Smith. So let's just start out with these tables. And I'm going to make a little chart. I'm going to make a little roster of the different clubs. All right, so I have John, Mary, Jim, and Sue, and I have ski, chess, and running. Let's just do a couple of the clubs, all right? Let's say the ski club contains Jim and John and Sue. The chess club contains Jim and Mary. And the running club contains all of them. 
Jim, John, Sue, and Mary. All right. Let's go and enter these people in now. All right. And I'll be switching rapidly between these, so we'll take a look. So we're first going to we're going to enter in the ski roster, the roster for the ski club. Now, the ski club has a club ID of one. All right. In the student table, Jim has a student ID of three, John has a student ID of one, and Sue has a student ID of four. And the ski club has a club ID of one. Now again, keep in mind this is only sort of the brute force way of getting data into these tables. You'll not be normally entering data this way if you have a completed uh, access application. But just to show you how the foreign key constraint works and all that, we're going to go and do it this way. All right. So let's go and enter the ski roster in. So I can go to the student club table. The first student, Jim, has an ID of three, and the club is one for ski. The second student uh, is an ID of one for the student ID and one for the club ID. Lastly, Sue, four, and one. Now, my student ID went from one through four. What happens if I try to enter in some outrageous value for that? That person 800 is in the ski club. It gives me an error, right? Why? Because there's a, there's a referential integrity violation between the stu in the student foreign key, between the student ID in this table and the student ID in the student table. Likewise, if I tried to put in person one is in some non-existent club ID, I'd get a similar error. Now, for the chess club, we have Jim and Mary. Now, the chess club is a club of two. Jim is three, his ID, and Mary is two. So we can go in and enter in for Jim, student ID of three, club of two, student ID of two for a club of two. Now, notice that Jim is in there twice right? He's in there here and he's in there, in there there. That's okay because the student ID by itself is not the primary key. The primary key is a combination of the student ID and club ID. So the combination must be unique. All right. Likewise, the chess club is in there twice. Once for each student. Because again, that's allowable because the chess club by itself isn't the primary key. Now what I can't do is I can't go and put Jim in the chess club twice. All right? Which makes sense. There's no real need to put him in there twice. If he's in the chess club, he's in the chess club. There's real, no real need to have two rows in there saying Jim's in the chess club. So that's okay. The other thing I can't do is I can't go in and say Jim is in some club, but I'm not telling you which one. All right? Because again, the primary key can't have a null value. But I could say then Jim is in the running club and go and add that. Any questions about this? If we think about it again, then we have two formulas or, or two patterns that we want to look for. And these are the most common patterns in relational databases. I mentioned before that there's three sorts of relationships, but really two of them are much more common than the other. The one-to-one -one relationship is actually kind of rare. All right? So we're going to leave it for a while. So really you have two relationships to worry about. And in fact, of those two relationships, one of them changes in to the other one. Right? Because if we have... We have our basic one to many. If we have a many to many, the many to many translates into 
to one the mayonnaise. And how do we put in, how do we implement a one to many relationship? All right. Always the same way. The many side points to the one side. And when I say points to, I mean has a foreign key. Has the one side, have, has the primary key field as an attribute in itself that points and is the foreign key. Questions at this point? What we're going to do for a while then is really, and, and we'll start it today and when we'll go over it um, next time uh, and we'll continue with this and we'll go through a few examples, is we're going to work on two things. First of all, we're going to work on identifying for a given problem what relationships exist. In other words, spotting these patterns. Do we have a one-to-many? Do we have a many-to-many? And then we'll take it to the next step and say, okay, now that we've drawn it out and sketched out the ERD and have identified the relationships, let's go in and actually create the database. Let's consider a few examples. And we'll talk about some of the examples even that are in the book. Let's say we had a veterinarian. Uh, let's say we were doing a database for a veterinarian. And we have pets and we have owners. All right. What's the relationship between pets and owners in a veterinarian's office? Yeah, I would say it's a one to many, right? The way you define that is an owner can have how many pets? Well, an owner can have a bunch of pets, right? If we did this example and we found out that an owner could only have one pet, you know, I'd have to go home tonight and get rid of two cats, right? Because we have three, all right? So it's quite clear that that would never work, all right? Therefore, we must know that an owner can have multiple pets. How many owners does a pet have? A pet just has one. All right. And again, forgetting the fact of like in a family, you could say the husband and wife own it. You know, for the purpose of a veterinary hospital, you know, there's the one person that owns the pet, the person they send the bill to. All right. So yeah, you could maybe quibble about that a little bit. But I, I think it's accurate to say that there's really a one-to-many relationship between owner and pet. So how would we implement that? What would we put where in the database to make this work? Go ahead. Put an owner ID and where would we put it? Yeah, in both. So we'd have the owner ID as a primary key in the owner table. The pet table would have a pet ID, but then the owner ID would also be a foreign key in the pet table to point to the one person that owns this pet. All right. Since it's the primary key of that, we know that there can only be one owner with that owner ID. So if it's one, two, three, four, there's only one person that's one, two, three, four. All right. What about if we were doing in a library and we had books and authors. What's the relationship between those two? Many to many? All right. How do we get that? One book can have how many authors? Book can have many authors. A given author has how many books? Well, you can have multiple books. So, how do we implement that? Well, we have to go and we have to break down that many to many into two one to many's. So we can call this the book 
author table. One book can be in the book author table many times and one author can be in the book author table. So primary key to this would be book ID. Primary key to this would be author ID. Where would the foreign keys live? In the book author table, right? So it would have a book ID here. That would be a foreign key. An author ID here. That would be a foreign key. And these two together would be the primary key. All right? Um, relationship between, let's see. Relationship between I'm trying to be tricky here. All right, it's too late in the day for me to be tricky, but we'll try. Okay, relationship. All right, here's a good one. Um, Here's a good one because we could argue it. Right? We could go either way on this one. Relationship between department in a store and product. So let's, let's talk about a grocery store. We have products, right? You know, two liter of Coke, um, bag of potato chips, um, bag of Oreo cookies, um, crackers, um, breakfast cereal. I'm going to run down all the products in the groceries. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and then we have different departments, right? We have the, the beverage aisle. We have the snack aisle. We have the picnic aisle. We have this and that and the other. What would be the relationship between product and store department? OK, said one to many. So, I assume you mean, yeah, one department can have many products, but a product is only in one department. Does anyone have a different view on this? Yeah. Could be a many to many, right? Because. You know, if you go shopping, you know, there might be, um, we'll be a good example, there might be marshmallows, let's say, in the baking supply aisle. There might also be marshmallows in the candy aisle, for example. All right? Um, there could be, um, you know, pardon me? Several kinds of chips, yeah. And there could be, for example, I've seen in some stores like that they'll have like an area for like picnic items. So there might be in the snack items, they might also be like, you know, here's a special for Labor Day picnics. You can go in there. All right. So what's the right answer here? This is where you have to know the organization you're doing the database for. Either one of these might be an appropriate answer depending on the store. This is where you'd have to go in and talk to the person and actually talk to different people at the store and ask them, you know, one product, is, is that going to be in, in, uh, only in one place or could that be in several places within there? It's a good idea to get several people's views, right? Because sometimes, you know, and uh, at the risk of, 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 of seeming like I'm um, um, belittling management, sometimes management doesn't know what goes on in the trenches. All right? Sometimes the workers don't have sort of the higher level view of, of looking forward. That's why it's good to get a range of views. You know, The person that stocks the shelf might be able to tell you, yeah, candy bars are in the baking aisle and they're also in the candy aisle and they're also over there by the checkout counters. right? Whereas someone as a manager might not be aware of that, just to give an example. It's good to get a range of views from a bunch of different people when you're trying to decide this. 
I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is that there's some cases where the answer is going to be pretty obvious, you know. The relationship between book and author. Yeah, we know that a book can have multiple authors, and we know that an author writes many books. That one's pretty obvious. But a relationship like this, it could be different ways depending on the specific organization you're talking about. And therefore, you need to know a little bit about the organization before you can make uh, an informed decision. Yes? Right. Right. Um, that's a great question. Um, ideally, um, you would um, go beyond and, and ask things like, are there any exceptions to this? Is it always like this? Are there any special times? You know, ideally, you would ask the probing questions. Um, one, uh, one good uh, uh, quote I heard about software development is, is I heard, um, and let me explain the quote uh, uh, after I say it, but the quote is something like, um, one of the bad mistakes you can make in software development is not listening to what your customer says. All right? The other mistake is listening to what your customer says. All right? Now what do I mean by that? I mean that sometimes your customer hasn't thought everything through. Therefore, it's your responsibility to ask probing questions. Or if you get like conflicting answers, bring those people together. You know, if the manager says, yeah, we do this, and the person on the floor says, oh, we never do that, get them together in a room, and you kind of have to be sort of the, the conduit or the me mediator for them to talk through so you really get a sense of that. That being said, yeah, it's a challenge. Um, you would try as much as you can to anticipate sort of normal changes in the business, but if you spend all your time developing an application for what could happen, you know, it's going to be really hard. So you really have to balance sort of like solving the immediate problem and hopefully building it with enough flexibility that if something changes, you'll be able to address that. But that's a great question. That's, that's sort of the art part of this that goes along with the sort of technical science part. Yes? Well, couldn't you, I mean, the way I would do it mm -hmm. is I, I would define it as, as a product is always going to be in one department starting out. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would be one possibility. You, you certainly could do that. Um, the student described possibly having a product in a department and then having a special ta sa uh, table for when, like, a product is moved and put, like, at the end of the aisle because the Super Bowl's coming up or whatever, and something like that. That would be one thing. You'd really have to, I guess what I'm saying is you'd have to study. Is this a typical case? Could it be in more than one of those places at the same time and really identify that? So there's ways to address that. Don't get me wrong. Um, but the, 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 the idea is, the bigger point I'm trying to raise is you'd really have to understand the way this particular organization does business and, and how to do it. Maybe they're only interested in the main department that it's in. Maybe, yeah, okay, we know that there's some mar marshmallows over there, but for the most part, that's where they get stocked. Maybe that would be their answer. Or maybe they would say, no, we want to be able to put it in as many departments as you can think of or whatever. You'd have to go in again, discuss it, and figure it out. So the solution you gave could very well be a very workable one, but you'd really have to know the organization to come up with a definitive answer. Sometimes and sometimes they don't even know. Again, and, and that's really the art of, of again, you know, you got to listen to them, but you also have to not listen to them. And, and by not listen to them, I mean don't accept their answers, um, you know, Question their answers, not in a, in a derogatory way, but in a probing way to sort of get to the heart of it, you know. Like I may talk to, you know, let's say I was doing a, 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 um, a database for LC, just to give a real simplistic answer. I might say, you know, students have one major, right? And they'll say, yep, right, students have a major. Now I could, I could take that and accept that answer, or I could probe and I could think, you know what, I've heard of students that have more than one major, I think there are, and I could like, are you sure about that? 
You know, are you really sure? Are there ever any students? Are you aware of anyone that ever? Oh yeah, well, once in a while. And then you get to the truth. So, so you have to take what they say, but sometimes you have to go and probe beyond that. Those of you that are in the CISS program, by the way, your capstone course, the, the systems uh, development course, systems analysis and design, I forget what it's called, uh, has a good example where you go and you do a product, uh, project. And again, the interesting thing is, although your technical skills are important, you know, you got to be able to do what you set out to do. Just as important are your communication skills and your speaking skills and your listening skills so that you really define the correct thing that you want to do. You know, nothing is more frustrating to develop a good program, for example, or a good database that doesn't solve your customer's needs. You did everything technically right, you know, but it doesn't do what the organization wants it to do. That's the most frustrating experience for everyone. If there's even a remote possibility that there's a many-to-many -many relationship, how would you ever do it? Uh, one -to -many? Why would the customer ever request uh, that's a good question. The question was is if, if there's even a remote chance. Um, I would tend to agree with that thinking. I guess it depends on how you define remote, you know. Uh, but yeah, if, if it's, yeah, you know, yeah, well, once in a while, yeah, you would definitely want to define it as a. Yeah. Why would you even give them a choice? Um, Inventory? Yeah, but wouldn't they keep checking Well, not really three different tables. You, you might have to do a query, but you could write reports that combine this data and all that. To your point, yeah, that's fine. And, and maybe the product example is, is a, a simplistic one where it's pretty easy to see what the answer is. But there will be other cases where it's less obvious. So you do sort of have to go in and, and interrogate and, and, and figure out. But yeah, to, to your point as far as that goes, one thing to remember, and this is, this is again uh, something that, that it takes a little while to, to uh, get a sense of, is when we talk about database design, we're talking about the way that we're going to store the data in the best organized way possible. How we then display it or report it, we can combine that data in any different ways. Remember, that's one of the reasons we're using a database is the flexibility that we get in defining it. So yeah, to your point, yeah, that's true. You might have to combine things together, but that's probably less of an issue if the, uh, compared to the advantages it offers you to have that flexibility. All right. Other questions? All right. We'll do something on Thursday. <laughs> All right. I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to check my notes. We very well might have a exercise where I introduce a problem to you, you take a stab at it, and then we talk about it. So we'll see you over in lab.